In the Surah of Noah, 71, 15, 16, it says, See ye not how Allah has created the seven heavens one above another, and made the moon a light, nur, in their midst, and made the sun as a lamp, siraj? The moon is called a light, Arabic nur, and the sun a lamp, siraj. Some Muslims claim that since the Quran uses different words speaking from about the light of the sun and the light of the moon, it reveals that the sun is a source of light, while the moon only reflects light. This claim is implied very strongly by Shabir Ali in his booklet Science in the Quran, and stated clearly by Dr. Zakir Naik in his video, Is the Quran God's Word? As you will now see clearly. The light that we have, the light that we obtain from the moon, where does it come from? So he will tell me that previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today after science has advanced, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it's a reflected light of the sun. I will ask him a question. That it is mentioned in this Quran, in Surah Al Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. Blessed is he who has created the constellation and placed therein a lamp and a moon which has reflected light. The Arabic word for moon is Qamar, and the light described there is Munir, which is borrowed light, or Nur, which is a reflection of light. The Quran mentions that the light of the moon is reflected light. You say you discovered it today. How come it's mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago? He will pause for a time. He won't reply immediately. And then may say, maybe, maybe it's a fluke. I don't argue with him. Pause here. Near the end of the video, we heard Dr. Naik explain the Arabic word for moon is Qamar. And the light described there is Munir, which is borrowed light, or Nur, which is a reflection of light. Please do not forget what he said. Munir is borrowed light, and Nur is reflected light. Not only is this claimed to be a statement in keeping with scientific truth, but it is also claimed to be scientifically miraculous, since this was supposedly only discovered relatively recently. It is correct that the moon does not emit its own light, but only reflects the light of the sun. But this was known already almost a thousand years before Muhammad. Aristotle in about 360 BC discussed knowing that the earth was round by its shadow on the moon. He could only speak of the earth's shadow crossing the moon if he knew that moonlight is reflected light. If you still insist that this is a miracle of scientific knowledge, then we must ask ourselves, do the Quranic words themselves support this claim? Siraj. First we shall look at Siraj. In Surah Noah, which was read above, in Surah Al-Furqan 2561, it is simply lamp, referring to the sun. In Surah Naba 7813, Sirajan Wahjan means a dazzling lamp, again indicating the sun. The words Nur and Munir come from the same Arabic word, root. The word Munir is used six times in the Quran. Four times, Surah Al-Imran 3184, Al-Hajj 228, Luqman 3120, and Fatir 3535, it is the phrase Kitab al-Munir, which Yusuf Ali translate as a book of enlightenment, and P Piktal uses the scripture giving light. Clearly this indicates a book which is radiating the light of knowledge. Nothing about reflection. Nur. It says in Surah Noah 7116 and Yunus 10.5 that Allah made the light, the moon a light. Thus we find that the Quran says that the moon is a light and it never says that the moon reflects light. Moreover, in other verses, the Quran says that Allah is a nur, a light. Surah Nur 2435, 
one of the most beautiful passages in the Quran reads, Allah is the light, nur of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is as if there was a niche, a niche, and within it a lamp, the lamp enclosed in glass, the glass as it were a brilliant star, and so forth. Thus we see that the word nur is used for both the moon and Allah. Are we going to say that Allah gives off reflected light? I think not. But if you continue to insist that nur used for the moon means borrowed or reflected light, and we saw above that Allah is the light nur of the heavens and the earth, what is the source of this light? Siraj, of which Allah is only a reflection. Think about it. If Allah is named nur or reflected light, who or what is the Siraj? Well, the Quran tells us who the Siraj is. But the answer will shock you. In Surah Al-Ahzab 33, 45, 46, we find, O Prophet, truly we have sent thee as a witness, a bearer of glad tidings and a warner, and as a lamp spreading light. Here it says that Muhammad is the lamp spreading light. In Arabic it is Wasirajan Muniran. Linguistically and spiritually, this is the end of the discussion. Linguistically, Siraj and the adjective Munir are used together for the same shining thing, the person Muhammad. It's clear Munir does not mean reflected light in this verse or in any other verse. It means shining. The people of Muhammad's time understood that the moon was shining and they were right. Just as the people of Moses' time understood that the sun was the greater light and the moon the lesser light and they were right. But if you insist that the Arabic words Nur and Munir mean reflected light, then, based on the use of these words in the Quran, Muhammad is like the sun and Allah is like the moon. Does Dr. Knight really want to say that Muhammad is the source of light and Allah is only his reflection? Why are these so-called scientific claims made which no Muslim can support if he makes a serious study of his own Quran? In a dialogue like tonight, it makes honest discussion very difficult, almost impossible. Let us go on and look at the water cycle. Some Muslims and other author, some Muslim authors claim that the Quran shows pre-scientific knowledge of water cycle. What is the water cycle? Here in this slide, you see four steps. The first step is evaporation. The water evaporates from the seas and the earth. Second step, it becomes clouds. Third step, it gives rain. And fourth, this rain causes the plants to grow. This is all very straightforward. And everybody knows two, three, and four. Even if they live in a town, they know that clouds come and rain comes and their flowers grow. But what about step one? The evaporation. You can't see it. It's difficult. And the Quran does not have step one. Now we're going to look at a prophet from the Bible, a prophet from 700 B.C., prophet Amos, and he writes, He who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns black was, blackness into dawn and darkness darkest, darkens day into night, and then who calls off for the waters of the sea, stage one, and pours them out over the face of the land, stage three. The Lord Yahweh is his name. And what, one other prophet is uh, Job. In 36, 26, 28, at least a thousand years before the Hejra, he says, how great is God beyond our understanding. The number of his years is past finding out. Stage one, he draws up the drops of water, which distill from the mist as rain. That's stage three. And then the clouds are mentioned. Stage true, stage two, which pour down their moisture and abundant showers fall on mankind. So here in the Bible, this difficult stage one is there from more than a thousand years before the Quran. Now let us go on and look at mountains. The Quran has more than a dozen verses stating that God placed firm and unmovable mountains on the earth. And in some of these verses, the mountains are listed as either a blessing for believers or a warning for the unbelievers. 
One example of this is found in the Sora Lukman, 31, 10, 11, where the mountains are one of five warnings. It says, he, was crea he has created the heavens. It says he has created the heavens without supports that you can see. And has cast Elka onto the earth firm mountains, Rawesia, lest it should shake with you. In the prophets, the Lenevia, 2131, as one of seven warnings, we read, and we have set on the earth firm mountains, lest it should shake with you, with them. Finally, in the B, Nahal 1615, says, and we, he has cast Elka onto the earth firm mountains, Rawasia, lest it should shake with you. We see then that the believers and unbelievers are told that Allah has done this great thing. He's thrown down and placed the mountains so that the earth will not shake violently with them. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, what did they understand? In the next two verses, another picture is given. The news. Anaba, 78, 6, 7. Have we not made the earth an expanse and the mountains as stakes? El Jibala Otadan, as those used to anchor a tent in the ground. And then the overwhelming, El Rashia, 88, 17, 19. Do they, the unbelievers, not look at the mountains, El Jibal, how they've been pitched like a tent? Here men are told that the mountains are placed as tent pegs. Tent pegs keep the tent stable. So again, the idea is put forward that the pegs, the mountains, will keep the earth from shaking. A third picture is presented in the word rawasya, used for mountains. This word comes from the Arabic root arsa, and the same root is used for the Arabic word for anchor. To throw out or cast the anchor is el ka al mirsa. So instead of cast the anchor to keep the ship from moving, we have cast the mountains to keep the earth from shaking. From these pictures, it is clear that Muhammad's followers understood that the mountains were thrown down like tent pegs to keep a tent in place, like an anchor to hold a ship in place, to stop the earth from moving, i.e. limit earthquakes. But in fact, this is false. The forming of mountains causes earthquakes. Therefore, these verses present a definite problem. Dr. Maurice Bukai recognized this and discussed them in his book, The Bible, The Koran, and Science. After quoting the above verses about mountains, he says, Modern geologists describe the folds in the earth as giving foundation to the mountains, and the stability of the earth's crust results from this phenomenon of these folds. When asked about this, Professor of Geology Dr. David A. Young says, while it is true that many mountain ranges are composed of folded rock, and the folds may be of large scale, it's not true that the folds render the crust stable. The very existence of the folds is evidence of instability in the crust. In other words, mountains don't keep the earth from shaking. Their formation caused and still causes the surface of the earth to shake. Geological theories at the present time propose that the hardened crust of the earth is made of sections or plates, which slowly move in relation to each other. Sometimes the plates separate, like North and South America separating from Europe and Asia, and Europe and South Africa. And sometimes they go together and they slide next to each other, and they bump into each other, and then they cause earthquakes. An example as time of mountain formation is found in the Middle East, where the migration of Arabia toward Iran has resulted in the Zygros range in, in Iran. In many parts of the world, as one travels along the roads, one sees a hillside where the sandstone Layers, which were horizontal when they were deposited, are now sticking up at angles. And so here you can see these sandstone layers, which were horizontal in the beginning. Now they're sticking up at 75 degrees, where they, be, they were pushed up there by an earthquake, by the mountains being formed. Sometimes the plates get caught on each other and stop sliding. During this period, great forces are built up. When the forces of friction are overcome, the piece of plate that was stuck lurches forward, causing the shock wave of a thrust quake. And all of a sudden it goes thunk like this. In a recent earthquake, it was calculated that the Cocos Plate in Mexico suddenly jumped forward three meters. Well, if your house 